And we're live. Welcome to the ASP.NET Community Standup. My name is John Galloway. I'm a PM on the .NET Community team. And today, I'm happy to welcome back Saurabh. He's been on a few times. And uh, also happy to welcome on Miriam. Yeah. So yeah, welcome. So today, we'll be talking about logging in ASP.NET Core. And the title of the show is Logging Updates for ASP.NET Core 6. But really, we're going to be talking about a lot of just logging in, in ASP.NET Core today, right? Yes. Exciting stuff. OK, well, so I'm going to jump right in with the community links. So let's start that. Do, 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 do. OK, so uh, community links are here. I, I paste it. I put all the community links in the show notes. I send them out. Uh, I'll send them to, you, to all our viewers in the mail. You cannot get away from these community links. OK. Let's start with the first one. Uh, this is a nice one from April Edwards, comparing between some of the different hosting options for, for Azure web applications. So you've got Azure static web apps, Azure web apps, and then Azure blob storage uh, static sites. And these are, these are kind of interesting, especially with things like Blazor WebAssembly, where you have options of the different places to host them. So, this is just kind of a nice summary and walkthrough of the different things that you can do and what they're all kind of best suited for. So, nice summary there. Uh, so, Arjun speaking about nine vital reasons to use Docker with ASP.NET. And, uh, you know, some great things, including um, just, you know, like CI CD migration. Definitely, runtime consistency is, is a big one. Um, so, just kind of a nice uh, summary there. OK, so Damien's continuing to go through these real deep dives into uh, security and identity with ASP.NET Core. And I love the way he's doing these in that he digs into kind of the, the real in-depth scenarios and kind of walks through all the different things. So here he's looking at securing an Angular application with multi-D identity providers. Um, so just kind of as, as he does, he, you know, going through with, with full code samples and, and uh, GitHub link to the project at the end. So I'm calling out this specific one, but just in general, if you take a look at uh, Damian Bowden's blog, he's been just consistent with these, digging into a lot of, you know, full end-to-end -end integrated security and authentication examples. So. Great stuff, and thank you for all the great blogging you do, Damien. Um, let me see. Uh, actually, whoops, that that one is not supposed to be in there. Okay, uh, so this one is looking at uh, Rachel's talking about Blazor debugging improvements in Writer. Uh, so this is, um, you know, developing with with Writer. You or excuse me, with Blazor, um, especially with debugging WebAssembly. Um, you know, it's great to have that that kind of built-in experience there. So she talks about the ability to kind of integrate with browser tools, uh, debug configuration for multiple projects, et cetera. So good to see that. All right. I'm just happy to see this one. This is Mike Brind. Uh, we featured his posts over the years on all kinds of things and um, definitely a lot of Razor Pages content. So. Uh, previously, he was focused on publishing all of these to LearnRazorPages.com. And uh, so it's exciting to see he's actually going into, uh, this is going to be published in a book. Um, so he's writing a full book on Razor Pages in action. And it's available in the um, MEEP Manning Early Access Program. So I'm very excited about this. Razor Pages are, are really full featured. I, I love that with Razor Pages, you know, it's, it's a pretty smooth model for getting started, but there's a lot of depth to it when you really want to dig dig deep and customize and and um, you know build a full featured application. And so excited to see this book on the way. All right, uh, so Rahul just calling this out again. He's he continues to create these amazing videos. So he's got over 12 hours of ASP.NET Core content in his YouTube channel. Um, so just, you know, great to see this and, and be sure to check that out. All right, I, I love how I'm getting this pop up on every single one. 
Uh, Dimitri uh, blogging about hot reload just all across the board in Visual Studio 2022. And uh, definitely talking about the, uh, the so it applies for a lot of different workloads, but definitely hot reload support for Blazor Server and Razor Pages. That's exciting to see. Um, so that control F5 to launch um, and you know then just being able to see your changes as you make them. And the big the big you know thing that kind of lit this up for me is understanding that uh, .NET watch run is great, but it restarts the entire application. You lose your application state. If you've gone through part of a workflow or filled something out, you lose all that. And it's also just slower. It's restarting the whole application. So that hot reload is so amazing because it can actually push those incremental differences down and you keep your application running. So you need to see all this and, um, and uh, just exciting to see those updates. And I'm, I'm mentioning things like the, um, you know, the, the ASP.NET things, but of course also being able to use it with other, uh, with other workloads and even C++, C++ is neat. All right. I should just give feedback and then be done. Um, Richard has, he's been doing these conversations about um, different things and he'll just kind of, it's kind of a round table discussion. And so this one is a round table discussion about the .NET open source project. Um, so just talking, you know, in depth, how has it worked? How did they run things? Um, what are some areas where engagement has worked and some kind of fun stories about early on as, as the open source project was being developed. So this is really just kind of a neat conversation with the people that run the open source project behind uh, the .NET project. So, all right. Uh, this is neat. So uh, Andrew Locke has been creating this uh, Security headers, whoops, I went to the wrong one. There it is. Uh, so it's an ASP.NET Core security headers, and this is a NuGet package that can add in all sorts of things like, um, like content type options, strict transport security, et cetera. These, uh, these uh, security headers are, are important uh, for, for a few reasons. One, they make your, your application more secure, but they can also have other impacts as far as indexing and you know making sure they pass security um, reviews and things. So so this I've had to implement some of these by hand in the past and it's a pain in the neck and I, I just love that there's this package that can light that up for me. And so um, this specific thing this was a, a tweet about an update for cross origin opener policy and cross origin resource policy and cross-origin embedder policy. So all these policies, it's nice to have those just kind of um, being able to turn them on with just a few lines. All right, and my last link to share, and uh, I've been talking kind of fast, but not trying to talk too fast, because I believe Miriam's finishing up a demo, which is really exciting. Is it? Is it ready? Yeah, it's ready. Oh, that's exciting, okay. <laughs> Um, so th this is this is cool. Matt announces Core WCF 020 release. So WCF, you know, was originally with .NET Framework was a you know .NET Framework feature. Uh, a lot of people really built a lot of complex you know things on this and infrastructure running on WCF. WCF is not natively directly supported in .NET Core. Um, you know, partly because it's a uh, like .NET Core is cross-platform and it's open source and it doesn't, like WCF was really built pretty tightly to Windows in a lot of places. And, and also some of the things are not, you know, as, as much modern patterns. It's not necessarily the way you would build things. Now, however, if you've got things that are running on WCF and you, and you wanna modernize and update them, Core WCF is an open source project. Um, and they've, they've been working on things like, so for instance here, authorized role attribute, uh, definitely, this is this is cool support for .NET 5 and also .NET Core 3.1. The, the, the one thing to add is Core WCF preserves binary compat. So if you have an old WCF client that you can't change, right, you can still uh, re-implement your server in Core WCF. So it, it, it it's, serves a niche purpose. We're not saying go architect new applications using this, but it does help you in, oh, I've already shipped the client, it's on 
you know, it's on somebody else's machine. What do I do when I want to preserve binary compat over the wire? Ah, uh, okay, okay, yeah, that's that's really, you know, and I've had several times over the years where I've spoken about .NET Core just in general at a conference or something. People say that's great, but I have, like you said, existing infrastructure built on WCF, and I don't know, you know, what's what's my path forward, and so. So anyhow, exciting to see that. So that is my end to the .NET community links for this week. And again, the, the link is there in the, in the chat and in that banner there. So, but today we are gonna be talking about logging in, in so .NET, like there's some new things in .NET uh, 6, but then also .NET 5 had some, some cool logging things as well, right? Right, yeah, um, so, for uh, for logging, we had a lot of uh, we we over the time frame of .NET uh, five, we went through a lot of backlog of issues for overall Microsoft extensions libraries and logging one of them, and uh, we figured out that like the topmost uh, voted logging issue was around uh, log formatting, uh, like having a giving the developers a way to. Be able to uh, to be able to uh, structure their own log messages, especially console logger, because like I think console logger is one of the more uh, used uh, loggers in our uh, framework. I don't know, like Sora and uh, John, if you agree. But uh, so we specifically focus on a console logger, and what we did is that we took uh, like we did a little bit requirement uh, gathering and figured out that uh, folks like to have a built-in JSON console logger that didn't exist before arrival, and also uh, uh, I, I, uh, the I think I hear a little bit of echo, but I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm not sure. Is that from your side, Rob, or is it? No, I have a hardware mute, so I mm -hmm. doubt that's my end. All right, I've turned mine down. Mm -hmm. So the the other thing is that aside from the JSON logger, we also provided the ability for developers to have their own type of loggers because like everyone has their own preference of if they want to have like time stamp first specific indentation so to make everybody happy we have kind of we yeah, added both types of things in FIBO and that was like the biggest feature for logging back then and I have a demo for that too yeah. and then we can also go through the uh, what happened in 6 or what's happening in 6 as well so the way I'm planning to showcase the demo is that I have two different uh, projects. I have a console and a, a Blazor server app. And I have this, um, um, the, um, uh, I hope it's gonna be uh, like, uh, you know, like uh, the, the plan I have is that I kind of put all of the code snippets per commit so I can show exactly how different changes in code will make a difference in the, in the output of the console logger. So for example, if uh, obviously if someone wrote down .NET new console, it would they would just get like uh, the hello world, uh, right? Like, so I'll just do. So I, I just want to add a, a little bit of context. I think yeah. I'll give Mariam a second to pull up her demo as well. Yeah. There, are, there are two things that Mariam's going to showcase. One mm -hmm. is we've added more built-in console log formatters, right? So pre, uh, prior to this change, we only had one way of showing um, uh, console logging, right? Like it didn't in involve structure, it was pre-formatted, it had color codes, you know, it, it made it unsuitable for some use case. Like, you know, maybe you had a tool parsing your console output and you lose structure, you get color codes that you don't want. Uh, um, so what we've yeah. done is we've added some built-in formatters. So we had system D already. The big one we added is JSON, right? Like who doesn't love JSON? It's simple, it's easy to parse. You have parsing, uh, like, log, like libraries in every language to parse it. So, you know, let's say you're doing a Docker container. You may want JSON formatted console log so that if you have fluent D, fluent bit on the other side, like consuming your console logs, it can turn it into structure and then you can see it in whatever your logging backend is. But there's also the scenario where Hey, like, I'm glad you guys did the JSON, but you know, I'm actually opinionated and I want certain color codes or I want, you know, 
like the output to look as per my specification. So what we've also done is like built, like created these new abstractions. I, I think it's called the iConsole log formatter, Mariam, keep me honest. And that yeah. allows you to implement your own way of uh, visualizing console logs. Okay. Right. And, so, uh, and since this works across both Windows and Linux, we've actually, uh, you can use uh, a subset of VT100 uh, control characters to format your console logs. And if the console natively supports it, we'll just pass it right through. So you'll see all that rich formatting. And if it's not, we actually reinterpret that on like, you know, an old Windows console that say doesn't support VT100 and still try and preserve all the semantic information conveyed through those control characters. Okay. Yeah, so I have demos for all of these that Saurabh mentioned. And um, so the kind of the commit that I had, like the initial one, this is how like prior to 5.0 it would work. Like you could have, you would have like a simple logger where like you have the timestamp info, the message and everything, right? And then, um, then like this is um, this is where we're at. But we, for that, we are in five. We did like a breaking uh, change that uh, we deprecated uh, something, and then like we provided a new way of setting up logger. And then if I do the git show, you'll see like the way we kind of do logging now. Like we have these new APIs called add simple console or like add JSON console, which is new. If you if we use the add JSON console API the output of the structure of the console logger will be a JSON format rather than what we saw. And um, then, so let's see. Uh, I just, so while you're now. typing that, a lot of people are saying, hey, yes. learn something new with Git show. That's that's kind of cool how you're, how you're showing these. Yeah. <laughs> nice, uh, thanks. Uh, so, so similar to add simple console, we have the add system D, but like behavior wise or look wise, the log formatter is the same, but the APIs are new, there are five APIs. And just for the sake of demo, I'll just show, uh, I'll just show that one too. Um, so what we had prior to this is we had a enum for formatting and obviously that's not scalable, right? We had like the regular and system D so what we did yeah. now is you can register your own formatter. So we added a couple of helper extension methods. So uh, the the existing format is now called the simple uh, format. We mm -hmm. also have the system D and JSON format, but you can also register your own uh, iConsole log formatter in DI. And you know if you wish to implement your own extension method, it works with options. So like you know what you see on Mariam's screen right now is when she's added system D. There's also like options that you can specify to each of these console log formatters. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we may see that with JSON as well, whether you want it like pretty printed or single line formatted, things like that. Yeah, uh, I'll show that one too. So we looked at systemd and then uh, it seems like I didn't add the JSON. I'll, just, I'll show the JSON one right after I show the custom one. Cause as I said, we all can also, developers can also write their own ones. So let's check out this. Um. So what, what's nice with this is this is um, you're changing just when you turn on the logging and all the existing log messages, those all just continue to work. Yes. Yes. So uh, the other thing is like Mariam showcasing it with code changes, but mm -hmm. as with, you know, most things in .NET Core, we have a config system, we have multiple configuration providers. So as an example, in uh, .NET 6.0, we said, hey, we're gonna be opinionated about, uh, like when you're running in a Docker container. So if you like right now, like pull a new .NET's ASP.NET Core 6.0 container, run an application in there, you'll see JSON formatted logs by default. And that's um. controlled via an environment variable. You know, that flows through the environment variable configuration provider. So it is something that we see you may want to choose the formatter based on an environment specific thing, right? Mm -hmm. And that's totally supported. Make sure all the formatters you care about are registered in DI and then just set up the right configuration for the right environment. Yeah, so uh, that's a good point. So not all, uh, thanks for uh, like clearing actually like how the whole things works because like 
what we're doing is that built in, we have some log formatters registered in our library, which is like the systemd, the simple one, and JSON, our own JSON a built in one. But like a developer, if they write their own, this one here, like custom formatter, they would have to not only implement how it looks like, but also implement what the options for it are. Like, for example, in here, uh, they might have like a custom prefix that they want to like say, OK, I want my custom one to have these properties X on top of like include scopes and times that format. So they implement the formatter. They implement all of these extra properties. But on top of that, they also need to register their console formatter into the our like DI system and everything. So like this diff, I'll just do a quick skim over like what's different. So not only uh, this is like an add custom format, it's just like a helper method just to make it look um, more readable. And um, so this is how they would probably, they would have a custom color options that uh, like basically has all the properties uh, on top. It will also have the custom prefix. And this one is just a, a helper for the text writer because all, as you sh as as you might have seen here in the output, I had like um, colors in the console logger, mm -hmm. right? And that that helps uh, like with the VT one hundred that uh, Sora mentioned, like the color codes and everything. This just helps uh, uh, just write down color code, like write with color and like with specific background and foreground. And so I'll just skim over, skip over these, and maybe one day that it will get into our uh, system console API, like so we don't have to write these extensions. But then the, the custom lock format color formatter is basically the logic behind. Okay, how do I want to have like? Do I want to have the color like dash green color first? So here, like text writer dot write with color some with some, some custom prefix with. Uh, some black color and green, and then write your actual message or whatever. So this was the whole diff that went into writing this uh, custom log formatter. So like this was the prefix, this is the message, and like this is the next message, and this is the next message. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, we've had a few questions about how this compares and fits in with Serilog specifically. And I know mm -hmm. kind of historically that was kind of always the guidance was like, hey, you've got these built in things and then you can use, we integrate with Serilog or other logging providers. So how does this work with that? So, so this is only applicable if you're using our logger. Like this doesn't change like the, the logging abstractions. So okay. if you're continuing to, if you're using Serilog, like continue to use Serilog. So this is specifically only if you're using the Microsoft extensions, logging.console provider for our abstractions, right? So it, okay. it, so like Serilog allows formatters on a per sync basis. Think of this as uh, formatters only for the console sync. Okay. That makes sense. So, and you can use them both together, right? You can have multiple log logging syncs. So uh, there are sort of two models in which you use Serilog. There is the one where there's only the iLogger provider for Serilog, but the recommended way is you replace your entire iLogger factory, right? So I, I think my understanding, and you know, I I, uh, I hope like I'm not offending any Serilog enthusiasts, the, the idiomatic way to use Serilog is replace the factory. So if you're okay. doing that, you probably wouldn't be using our console logger anyways. Uh, but you know, like this isn't a one is better than the other. This solves a need that we found. I, you know, I, I gave you the example of when you know run in containers, you want mm -hmm. JSON formatting. That's for what we think is core functionality it has to be built into the framework. But Serilog is an amazing library, right? It has, has extensibility that, you know, in ways that our library cannot compete with and doesn't intend to do everything that Serilog does. Okay. I can, I can actually probably show the JSON one as well. Uh, maybe on this other app, the Blazor server app, I was just running the, like the plain one, the template, like I'm at the checked out here a new Blazor server. When you run it, this is like the familiar logs that you see. And um, I'll 
maybe switch it to something that's like another a custom one and see like how the how the same logs would probably um, change. Run. So we're looking at these logs here. So oh. this, like, you change the prefix, I mean, like the whatever, and like the same message goes. And uh, I think, um, I wonder what I have in here. So like you see, uh, another way rather than writing code, like in the source code, we can also use configuration to set our like custom prefix suffix or like even like single line or whatever, or even like we can switch here to say we want the JSON formatter or like the simple formatter or the uh, system D or like the custom one or anything. Um, so just another way to configure okay. the logger. A uh, question from Jose, can this be used in a WPF application? I'm, uh, I'm gonna assume yes, uh, Sora. Well, I mean, ordinarily in, in WPF, you don't really use the console, right? Mm -hmm. okay. It's a GUI based app. So this is a, a console only for matter. So it okay. seems. Oh, right. This is only for yeah. console. So you would do logging using some other log sync. Some other logging sync, right? So yeah. probably not the yeah. best fit. Okay. Um, overall, like we also have like, uh, I mean, aside from the WPF, like we all, in the, uh, with Microsoft extensions, we have like debug logger, uh, console logger, like event source logger, all of that. But this is only for the console logger. Okay. And, um, so I think the next thing I wanted to show was the in this era area is uh, like JSON. Uh, let's see. So we're checked out here with config. So okay, let's see what I have here. And then I'll switch it to JSON. So this is probably just another, like, okay, this one is like color included as well, just a mm -hmm. different lover. Um, now I'm just gonna switch this to JSON and see if it will, if I'm missing anything that needs to be um, set. Yeah, so like you see, this is the prefix, this is the suffix. And if I should probably be able to even change this. Actually, before I change to JSON, change the prefix and suffix and that should uh, I didn't I wouldn't even need to um, restart the app when I change this it will like uh, immediately make a change um, but I, I don't have anything to log so that's I, I probably won't be able to show that actually maybe um, yeah never mind uh, I'm just gonna if I run it again. Yeah, so this changed, and now let's change this JSON. And um, another thing I need to do with the JSON is I need to, um, in program we have, okay, in startup, I had this uh, registered before because I, when Saurabh was explaining, he said, and we said like the built in ones are already registered. But uh, for the custom ones, we also need to register uh, our own. So, but because code takes precedence, I'll need to kind of uh, comment this portion out. Um, let me just do that piece. Okay. Well, you're doing that. I had a uh, question, yes. in, and I think this is related. So, this is a question about support for database and elastic storage. So, to make sure I'm understanding, and and I think. You've both clarified this a few times, but this is this is the console logger specifically, right? Are it feels like some of these enhancements that you're making could be useful for other things, specific formatting. Is is there a thought that this might be useful for other like file loggers or other sorts of things? So the the challenge for us is we already had an abstraction for logger providers, right? Uh, so yeah, like 
if you add a new API such that every provider in the ecosystem is now forced to support formatting, that like breaks the ecosystem, right? The point is to have, like we've had these abstractions for like six years now. You don't want every logger out there to just stop working because someone registered formatter, right? So if I had a clean slate and I design it again, absolutely, I would love for providers to be able to opt into formatting. Like you said, a file logger is a great candidate. You know, a database logger, maybe not because it's it's a structured binary format. You have to abide by whatever the database wants. But given that we control the console logger provider, we could do this in a non-breaking way that still benefits most people. Mm -hmm. Okay. That makes sense. So what you see in the here is just that uh, basically what I ended up changing all in the diff probably shows is that I changed these ones don't matter anymore because JSON doesn't use them. But like some of these are like in JSON writer options indented true. Like if I change this to false, it will change the indentation sort of. So like these these are places. This is formatter options is where you dump the, all of the properties, and this is where you kind of switch the name, uh, switch the name of the what's it called um, the formatter. So I re I actually didn't need to rerun again, but I just don't have anything to log. But so then I just. The same logs are now just in a single line because they're all non-indented. Okay. Yeah, and that's like the built-in one. Um, that's it for the 5.0 feature. And there is like a full-on docs page about like all the little pieces of like th different parts of the feature. So I, I'm hoping like this whole thing will cover anything we didn't cover today. And um, yeah, um, if there's no questions, we can go to the six. Uh, yeah, I think that's it. There's some, you know, questions about will this get picked up by like Azure streaming services? I know there's like the streaming log. Um, so I think that there's some Azure, um, like an in, in app insights that, that do pick up the console logging, I believe. So, yeah, I was actually just typing up an answer. If you're okay. running in uh, AKS and you've enabled, I think it's called the checkbox is enable monitoring. So that's enabling container insights. Uh, console logs gets uh, collected and sent to log analytics. So to whatever the uh, LA workspace associated with your AKS cluster was. If you're running an app service for Linux, you can go to the diagnostic settings blade in your application and enable collection of uh, console logs. Uh, for uh, everything else, we have other ways like, you know, application insights space way of collect collecting fully structured logs that actually give you like a higher fidelity of information than just like plain console logs would give. And those are the idiomatic ways to do logging in those environments. It's uh, you know hopefully something I can come back on the show and talk about in greater detail. Mm -hmm. Okay. So moving on to um, yeah, moving on to six uh, zero. What we have for six zero is um, we have a logging source generator. So the reason is we have different kinds of APIs. We've historically had different kinds of APIs for logging and like log information, log warning, like all those sets of APIs. And also we had a more performant one that it uses action returning, like as, like logger message. You would use logger message .define and you would have like these um, more, and then you will end up getting more performant logs. So, but it's less user friendly. So the aim at the source generator is to have Kind of mix both worlds of like having a way to write down log logger messages that are easy to write, but at the same time they use the performant way behind the scenes. Okay. Um, so I'll have a little quick skim over the docs page, and um, basically, what the user will end up writing, they will have the, they will uh, use an attribute over their method. That's like a partial method that uh, takes the logger and also takes all of the arg message arguments in the message template. So in this case, if they wanted to have like a 
critical level log message. They just provide the message here, message template here, and then they pass along, pass out, pass along the arguments. And um, yeah, uh, so is there anything you wanted to add over this? But before I, I, I think there were a couple of questions coming in about can we use this on .NET five? So. I don't want to mm -hmm. break your train of thought, but we can talk about how it's no, a no, no, standard to one library. Yeah, you should go. I, there's no train of thought, so I'll let, let that conversation go first before. No, I, mean, I think just to, to clarify, like mm -hmm. while this does ship as part of these like 6.0 wave of the Microsoft extension libraries, these are net standard to one libraries. Uh, you can use them on like 5.0 applications. You know, in fact, you know, 6.0 is still going on. We would love to get feedback feel free to try it out with your 5.0 applications and let us know what we can do. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay, um, let's I see. Want, so I want to make sure I understood too. So th the previous thing you were showing was specific to formatting with the console logger. Yeah. For this co compile time logging source generation, what, what logging does this apply to? This is... Um, I, this, this is not specific to a like console so logger. This site. applies to every provider. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. So anywhere uh, in the applications where today using log information, log debug, those APIs, we can kind of change them out and use these ones instead. Or even the ones, um, if, yeah. So like, because those are kind of not performant, but then the good thing about them, they were like, if you want to write a quick hello world application, you just write one line and you're done with it. But like, mm -hmm. this is hopefully as fast to write as well. And okay. Too. okay. And uh, it, it also comes with a bunch of diagnostics as well. So just in case someone writes this whole thing incorrectly, there will be like hints as to like, okay, don't do this or whatever. Like uh, maybe you have a mismatch number of uh, arguments in your message template. So it's just kind of his like a better guide as well as long like gives you a lot of compile time errors. Right. Okay. Um, yeah, uh, I'm trying to skim all the way down before doing the demo. Um, so like in here, there's a bunch of different little features here. Um, so like this one also shows some demos here. Like if you uh, like here, there you have like two arguments passed, and then in the test in the sample, you're writing the message, but you pass down the uh, level later. Like you can have like dynamic log levels. You write this down for different levels, but in the code, you will kind of pass down the level you want, as opposed to the other way that where you're just like specifying this method will always give you trace level. And another thing is like you, you if you have like different event IDs for different log messages here, there will be a diagnostic helping you out to say if you if actually ended up using twenty for both of them, so that later on in like uh, like other when whenever you want to retrieve logs and filter by ID, then you actually don't end up having two different log messages with the same event ID grouped into. Okay, one. okay. So by being more kind of structured in how you're writing your logs out, you're able to get that compile time checking and and see those yeah. things ahead of time. Yeah, so let's, I'll, I'll move to see where I, okay, um, where I have my um, demo. Um, so while Maureen yes, pulls this up, like you. for some, some context, right? The, you get started with the logging libraries, the most common pattern is you do logger dot like log information or log error one of those methods right and the the unfortunate uh consequence of that is at every call site we have to parse the template strings extract the you know the named parameters preserve structure and then call the like each of the providers saying hey here is this like um like go format this in whatever way you want to the so the benefit of these like uh, strongly typed delegates that we had like introduced prior to this was that you can at one point at application startup basically pre-compile these message templates, have these delegates, and then at the logging call site, just call into the delegates, right? 
no need to write this, no need to pay the penalty. However, that's it's it's not a very ergonomic or easy to use API. Like if you want to see an example of a library that uses it all over the place, like take a peek at the ASP.NET source code. It makes it a little like hard to read. So so here what we've said is this isn't like necessarily better or anything. We've taken an opinionated stance. We think allowing you to define these partials and then you know using like like decorating with attributes and just writing the logging methods makes the consumption a lot easier, right? So this is something where if you have a library with a lot of logging messages, feel free to use this to like like clean up your code and ha like it's just a more ergonomic API to use. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so I just picked up one example, like but then the docs page has tons. Is just basically as we said, you all you would need to do is you kind of have your partial method over a partial class, and then um, by the way, we have you can also have nested classes. Like you can place your logger message in a nested class as well, and that's also supported. So, um, but I didn't do it uh, in this sample. Okay. And then yeah, um, you provide uh, the event ID, a log level, and the message. And the message, obviously, up here somewhere. Yeah, the message template, whatever it, the name, uh, Batman is eighty, whatever, all of the sentence. But like in one of them, you have zero args. Like I, this is all hard coded. The other one, like you also have like the arguments. And um, one sample is this one, the logger message up here. The other one is logger dot log warning. It's like the 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 old way. I mean, it's still. Okay, to I guess use it, but it's the like the less performant API where you pass down your message and like a bunch of uh, arguments. But you you could totally use the other template here and write your logs. Um, okay. I'm trying to think if there's anything I missed about the source generator um, that we want to talk about. So I mean, this is kind of related. There's a question on just the impact of too much logging on performance in production. Um, so this, as you're saying, the source generator should be more performant. So yeah. that should have less of an impact. But do do we need to worry about like should we only log some things in in development or? So so the short answer is yes, right? If you log too much, it will impact performance. Now, uh, it's, there's a trade-off between observability and performance, uh, and that's you know domain-dependent what determination you make. There are a couple of mitigations you know in place, like one, pick your log verbosity appropriately. Don't make something that should be a like a debug or a trace-level log into a warning, so it's enabled by default. Also, at the logging call site, if you're doing something expensive like you know if you're serializing an object so that you can log it, it's always good to gate your log methods with a, an enable check. And I think th that's something uh, we have, you know, even in the, the delegates, there's a is enable check that you can pass. Like basically don't do any expensive work unless you're certain that someone is writing this uh, or making use of this data. So. With those mitigations, you can always do that. So it's not logging; isn't a all or nothing. Like once you're you have more maturity in your infrastructure, you can start doing things like I want to momentarily turn up the verbosity when I'm investigating a problem and things like that. So basically, make the right trade-off between observ observability and logging overhead. Okay, that makes sense. Maybe just like also an add-on is that. Um, we also tried to do a little bit of benchmarking while we added the logging source generator. And we kind of came up with a bunch of interesting observations here. And like the is enabled check that uh, Saurabh mentioned is, um, first of all, let's say like the log warning API that we just looked at, that like we use it if we want to just write something really fast, is obviously not very performant. And when it's, um, I, I, I'm kind of, what I will do is that I maybe, uh, John, I can give you a link to this page or like the issue that links this in case someone wants to go deep dive into like all of these. Yeah, benchmarks. actually so, we did have a, a question on that and you can use in StreamYard, you can send that to me in the private chat and I'll send it yeah, out. Yeah, I'll to send the, it, yeah. And um, 
Yeah, so it's linked to another issue that we have on like just checking down the performances of like blogging and everything. But like overall, the conclusion is that um, I, like where where is this like scrolling up here? There we have this. Uh, if the developer, when they know exactly something is enabled, if they use, uh, there is this skip enable check, there's a new API somewhere in 6.0. If they use that rather than, um, maybe I should just bring it up, log options. I, uh, I, I sort of want to make sure yeah. we don't get like lost in the weeds here. The yeah. skip enable check is what I would call a micro optimization, right? Yeah. I think the, the pattern I was alluding to is, uh, make sure the logger is enabled before you do any expensive work, right? Okay. So when you use that in conjunction with the logger provider, you can do this thing where you end up checking if the logger is enabled twice. Mm -hmm. Once you check before you perform like the expensive work to prepare the data for logging, and then mm -hmm. once more, the delegate will perform a check before it actually executes. So this is just an optimization to avoid that second check for is enabled. Uh, this this isn't like the yeah. the pattern that we're talking about though. I would still recommend people check if the provider is enabled before they do any expensive work. Yeah. So like for uh, it seems like the summary is log warning should be guarded against is enabled check to avoid bad perf and unnecessary allocations. Uh, yeah, I think that's what you also. Yeah. Right? So um, maybe because uh, yeah. So I'll link this. Uh, benchmark to you, John. And then uh, the other thing I think that's in 6.0 that we kind of wanted to uh, show as well is if there's nothing else we wanted to talk about, the source generator is uh, the logging analyzer. Um, we can maybe switch to that subject as well. Sure. Um, so we have, there are a so when someone is writing the, there's a bunch of APIs uh, in logging and if it's the most important diagnostic that we added is the one where when you, the user is writing down this API, for example, they use the logger message dot define API. And a lot of the times they might write down a message template, but Mario, like- I'm just gonna interrupt you for a second. Do you mind yeah. zooming in? That's yeah, a bit hard to do. Yeah, I'm going to do that. Uh, you, yeah, just browser. Yeah, it is. So we added a bunch of diagnostics, basically, and I'll show a, like uh, I'll show a screenshot. I don't have a demo, but I have a screenshot of like how each of uh, five of them, probably what they're kind of trying to catch. But the but the the most important one is basically the last one, and what it does is that when you're writing the logger message define APIs, uh, for example, and you uh, end up writing the message template. If you don't, if you have a mismatch between the number of message items arguments and your, you know, uh, oh yeah, the, 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 the number of arguments, then it will kind of give you compile time error rather than the runtime, which will be really helpful in product code because, like, sometimes uh, people might implement this, but not use it for a while and then enable it, and then like in product code, like they will catch them late. But this is going to give them the compile time error. So, so you know, let's, let's if we look at an analogy, right? Like these log message templates, you know, if you squint and you know look funny, it it, it looks like an interpolated string in some ways, right? Mm -hmm. So if you think about like interpolated strings are super easy to use because you get all the compiler goodness when you're working like in your editor. It, it's really easy if you have like you know a, a type mismatch or if you don't have the right number of parameters. Those are all easy to catch. The thing with these log message templates are, if you use the, uh, these are, these message templates are parsed at runtime, and then we try and like fill out the structure, right? So it does mean that it it is e easy to get wrong, right? And mm -hmm. you wouldn't find like, especially like if it's like some esoteric log that only happens for a one in a million error, you're probably never even going to get coverage for it, right? So our, our goal here is to try and find errors. Now, this is by no means exhaustive, right? There is limited information we have available at compile time. So there will be some like false negatives, right? We will not detect every incorrect use of the logging APIs, but we definitely 
you know, don't want, like, we're trying to avoid, like, catch as many things as we can without having any false positives, right? So we yeah. will be conservative in warning you that something is wrong. Okay. So this is the screenshot I was trying to show here. I apologies if it's really small. I'm just going to zoom in a bit more. Um, so this would have been a sample that covers all five diagnostics. And obviously just one of them is by default warning. Uh, the rest are hidden, I believe. And um, so if you kind of, like what we did with ASP.NET Core when we were adding this feature, we kind of enabled all five to figure out if there's any of these five that in the ASP.NET Core repo are actually not being, like the, the analyzer is caching and then kind of obviously not the warning one there wasn't any for that but like the little little ones that are like the the pascal it was maybe pascal case instead of um camel case like those kinds of things kind of there were some use there were some samples in the SPNR4 equal that might be benefit might benefit uh, Mariam, do you just want to talk to it like walk mm -hmm. over each line and just tell I, people yeah, what the anti-pattern is Yes. Like, so, forget the, uh, I think the error messages, just let's do it in simple English. Okay, let's see. Um, so if you have, um, first of all, you see this uh, one, two, three, like uh, obviously we want to have Pascal casing for arguments. That's one of them. And uh, because of that, this message here would have given like a squiggly. And then the second one is that when you're using the like, uh, zero and zero here this is also something we want to avoid we actually want to use named uh values na na proper names for our the placeholders in the message template so this one that's zero and this one that's zero is actually not something we want to do and the third one says um when you are writing down your log message you don't want to have like uh, you want your messages to basically be constant messages, mm -hmm. not that, if, if that makes sense. Uh, uh, so like you don't want to have like something plus 22 because that not doesn't really make sense in the logging world. But I'll let Sora add to that. Right. Okay. I, I think just uh, the order Marion was going in was from the error messages, not the order of the string. So that was maybe a little uh -huh. hard to follow. Uh, so, you know, I think mm -hmm. I, I'll just recap it at a high level. Ahead, yes. One is the you know, conventions on how you name the uh, uh, the named holes in the message templates. Mm -hmm. So like, uh, if we look at the first line, this is a test message. Uh, you should be using Pascal casing. If you look at the second line, uh, the, the named hole should not be a numeric only identifier. It should have like alphanumeric characters as well, right? So those were like, the first category was, uh, around named holes and conventions on what to name them. Yeah. The, is, there, is there a reason that should be Pascal case? Like, I, uh, is it so just... we, we, like if you go to message templates.org, I, I hope I have the URL, right? We are implementing a standard, right? So oh, the, okay. the expectation is, I think these are semantic conventions. They may not be syntactical conventions, but there are expectations, you know, there are providers in the ecosystem that may rely on these semantic conventions. So this is enforcing those semantic conventions. Okay. All right. Uh, so yeah, so the first category was around uh, naming of uh, the, the named holes. I guess a lot of names in that sentence. Uh, <laughs> the, the second category was a, a mismatch between the uh, message template and the number of parameters sp specified. So if we look at the last line that var x equals, right? You see the the number of named holes does not match the number of parameters. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so that, that that's one of the uh, like that's another issue. And then the the third category, which is it, this is subtle and it's a little hard to get. So let's look at line three, which is looking for an analyzer zero, and then it says plus twenty two comma eleven. The the message template is actually the, you know, that string that says looking for analyzer plus 22. We're like, that's an expression that's being evaluated at runtime, okay? Right. And what we're saying is 
the message template should be constant on at the log side. You shouldn't change the message template. When people are doing this, I, I know it says like plus a, a constant expression here, but we sort of don't have like all the heuristics available. Imagine if you had done plus a variable there and that variable changed on every execution, right? That means yeah. it should have been something that was captured as one of the named parameters in the message template and not as part of the message, like the template string itself. Okay. Right. That, it's a little subtle. So, uh, yeah, that's related kind of to that question, uh, Alexi's asking about uh, he normally uses plus for multi line messages to, um, because the compiler is normally going to join those strings. Is there is it better to do this differently if you're doing a multi line message? Like, would you use a template or? I'm not I, sure. <laughs> so, I, I, I think, you know. Off the top of my head, I, I don't know the, the implementation details, but the idea is if it's a constant expression, then mm -hmm. you should be fine. And if you're not, then I think, thank you for helping us identify something live on the air. Uh, <laughs> the, the idea is to avoid a non, actually, I, I hesitate to use the word constant expression because mm -hmm. like when you do log a message dot define, that gets evaluated only once. So the expression doesn't have to be constant. So th this is, I think we don't have all the heuristics in place to make a proper determination. I I hope we've picked the right defaults and that's something like, thank you for the food for thought. We'll go back and revisit, but uh, there may be a couple of like false negatives here. So for for this, the uh, so you said that um, these are not all enabled by default, these, Just, these analyzers, right? So I would need to go in and, and add these in my project file. I believe that it's hidden, um, but yeah, like you would be able to um, enable them specifically. Okay. Yeah, but like by default, the most important one, because if it's not there, you will, you will get a runtime, except, a runtime exception. Uh, that's why it's enabled by default is this one where like the int here, like the, there's one here, but three placed in the message template. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. There's a fifth one we didn't talk about, and that's kind of just hinting to the fact that these first three are using lock trace, lock trace, lock to critical, and these are the APIs that are like the less performant ones. And we just kind of want to, uh, we don't want like to over pollute the error list. That's why it's hidden, but like kind of trying to hint towards not, not using them as much, unless it's kind of like a short demo application. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. This makes sense. Yeah. And th you know, this is like, uh, this is a work in progress, right? If we find that there are other anti patterns, we would love to add to these list of analyzers, right? I think it sort of let uh, like perfect not be the enemy of good enough. We think we have things that are already of value. Like mm -hmm. I see some conversation in the chat too, where people are like, oh, I've done that. So we want to get it out there and help people out. And you know, if you give us feedback, we'll add more stuff, like more analyzers and help detect more anti-patterns. Maybe add, to add to that is like, I uh, just wanted to also show that like, uh, first of all, like the first feature we had, the console log formatter, it had like 38 upvotes for 5.0. And that's why we kind of did it. And then um, for logging source generator, it also was kind of something that people wanted. and uh analyzer also like we're kind of trying to follow up on all of the feedback we get and um the source generator itself when it was previewed in i think preview four we kind of listed all all of, all of the issues that we kind of was the feedback from community and kind of slowly added fixes for each of them and then it's also a work in progress just wanted to kind of point that out uh as well so like all feedback is welcome and um in terms of the analyzers, maybe uh, Saurabh was, uh, we were thinking of maybe another potential would be like the string interpolated. If someone is using like, actual interpolated strings rather than kind of, the, like if they're using the dollar sign, we can maybe could in the future add an analyzer to. To, to go and, along with what yeah. people are saying in the chat, I'm sure I've used interpolated strings there, just not thinking about it, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, I think, you know, we hadn't, I don't think the show has given much love to 
I think the Microsoft extension space, and this is sort of like, you know, like even though the abstractions are fixed, there's a lot of value we can add and we continue to, you know, iterate in this space. Uh, so, you know, like just, you know, want to thank folks for keeping the feedback coming and, you know, hopefully some, if not all of it, it'll be useful to you. Yeah, yeah, this is really helpful. I agree, this is something that it's like, it's important, it's not necessarily super flashy, but it's really important information to have in your application. Obviously, when something's not working, you need your logging to, to help you find that and resolve those issues quickly. Um, so yeah, I, I, this, this is great. Um, so, and then as far as, you know, if people have other questions or if um, people are looking just like this, would the, would the best place to be like just log an issue in the, in the ASP.NET Core repo or? In the .NET slash runtime repo. .NET slash runtime, okay. Yes. Yeah, and I, you know, just, just these, like, you know, the Microsoft extensions libraries were built as part of the ASP.NET Core project, but mm -hmm. they're clearly like, you know, broadly, applicable outside of just that app model. So they've been moved to .NET runtime to reflect that. That happened, I think, about a year or so ago. And now we're actually seeing them used in other app models as well. I think the new Maui templates make use of uh, the, the genetic host and a whole host of uh, host of the Microsoft extensions library. So. OK. All right. Wow. Well, this is this is this is great information. It's um, I appreciate you know all that you went through a ton of demos there, and I really appreciate you putting that all together and describing it so well. And um, you know, as you said, Srab, that's definitely something where uh, any time you know that you think is a good time to kind of update people. I'm I'm always kind of scouring around and trying to find you know right. find who you know what we can show off, and and um, so that was something that's was in a recent blog post and it's kind of to, you know it's in in the long list of wow there's all the blazer this and this uh, you know but yeah. like i agree like these kind of infrastructural things are really important so yeah thank you for thank you for um having us and then um we'll keep you posted on other other extensions um uh, features as well when it's ready for demo awesome Okay. Well, thanks everyone for watching the great questions today. And thanks again, Miriam and, and Saurabh for, for the explanations and the great demos. Thank you. Right. Thanks for having us, John. Bye everyone. Bye.